There are two ways to not enjoy the Rings of Power. As a Tolkien fan, likely complaining about discrepancies with Tolkien's vast history and lore, or as a not Tolkien fan. When I first watched this season, I'd only watched the movies and read The Hobbit. At the time, I didn't care about Tolkien's lore. I was just bored with basically five subplots all being juggled, making for a glacially slow experience. But since then, I've read The Silmarillion, immersed myself in the appendices, read The Unfinished Tales. I'm more familiar with the lore Tolkien built for this world. Now I can dislike this season twice as much. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding, mostly. Most of the time when I do these fixed videos, I'm not interested in the source material. Most of the time, I haven't read the source material. Also, I don't subscribe to the idea that the source material is always superior to the adaptation. You can do a lot more in a 500 page book than you can in a two and a half hour movie. So if someone was adapting a book of that size or larger, I wouldn't recommend doing everything the book did. It would be a bloated slog if you tried. This is likely why you didn't see Tom Bombadil in the movie. Most of the time, I'm only looking at what will make the best story in the adaptation, even if it means ignoring or contradicting the source material. But I like Tolkien's history for this world, and I can't help but think this series could have been better if it had honed closer to what Tolkien wrote, when possible. Rings of Power is set in Tolkien's second age, and Amazon didn't have the rights to books like The Silmarillion and Unfinished Tales, which have information about this era they chose to set their series in. They did have The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings trilogy, story set near the end of the Third Age. Return of the King does have appendices about the Second Age, so it seems they're not going in completely handcuffed. The showrunner said they took all these clues they connected to write the novel Tolkien never wrote about the Second Age. On paper, that's a great idea. House of the Dragon Season 1 covers 24-ish years, but the book Fire and Blood is sparse on the details, covering so much ground in one chapter. So House of the Dragon had to invent stuff. And sometimes, in not strictly speaking sticking to the canon, they made interesting choices that made me reevaluate some of the stuff we knew from the book. With how little Amazon could use from the Second Age, Age, I would not have minded them inventing stuff that didn't originate from Tolkien. Stick to the timeline, but expand and elaborate in a way that doesn't contradict that timeline. House of the Dragon doesn't nail it every time, but they did an okay job sticking to the timeline they had. Rings of Power does not. In a world with this longevity, all the important stuff is not going to happen all at once. Looking at this timeline from the appendices, they compress 1600 years into, I don't know, a few months? Assuming Farazhan stages a coup immediately after the death of the king. That is insane! Before looking at this timeline, I defended this show. They don't have the rights to the Cimmerillion or Unfinished Tales, but no, they threw what they did have the rights to in the bin, and there's no excuse for that. I wouldn't even call the series Rings of Power, as that kind of limits the time period they can work with. It might be a little on the nose, but I would have called it the Rise of Sauron, or the Shadow of Sauron, as he is pretty much the only character who is consistently present throughout the Appendix timeline. Season 1 would span from 500 to 1200 of the Second Age, though we can play with the timeline a little when we need to, as the Appendix says the records of this time are few and brief, and their dates are often uncertain. Maybe not so uncertain that we should compress 1600 years of stuff into a year, though. The Cimmerillion mentions, after Morgoth was defeated, Sauron repented, and some say this was not done falsely. This would be quite a while later. He began to stir again in 500 of the Second Age, so it's logical we would still see some of his time of repentance. And his rationale should make a little bit of sense. At least at first. This is the guy who was promoting human sacrifices at Numenor centuries later, so we do want to make it clear he is a villain. But at first, we should see where he's coming from. This is a war-torn world, even centuries after the fall of Morgoth. These were dark years for the men of Middle-earth. The Cimmerillion says the Numenorians had to teach them how to farm, so I imagine the men of Middle-earth Earth as brutal savages. It might make a lot of sense for Sauron to be surrounded by this darkness for centuries and finally say, I'm sick of it. I can bring peace to this land. The appendices say the elven city of Eregion was founded by Celebrimbor, but Unfinished Tales says Galadriel and Celeborn founded Eregion. More on them in a second. I read Celebrimbor as eager to see the divisions among the different races mended. Eregion was less unfriendly with the dwarves than the Sindar, thematically appropriate with Sauron wanting peace. This explains why Celebrimbor and the elves at Eregion were won over by Sauron. Unfinished Tales says Galadriel wasn't fooled by Sauron's seduction, and mentions her contact with the Nandorian realm of Lorinan on the other side of the Misty Mountains. Christopher Tolkien, compiler of Unfinished Tales, speculates these elves came to Lorinan under the leadership of Galadriel. Accepting Amazon didn't have the rights to Unfinished Tales, let's use Galadriel's flight from Eregion from Unfinished Tales. It's either that, make up something brand new, or don't use Galadriel at all, as there's little with her in the appendices. Unfinished 
Unfinished Tales says Kelleborn refused to go into the Dwarven Mansion, so he stayed in Eregion. The Rings of Power we got wanted to give us a Kelebornless Galadriel, and this is the way to do that. A lot of people did not like how Galadriel was portrayed in the series, and she is pretty horrible. She threatens to murder a dude who saved her life because someone else wants to hold her captive. But I think there is a way we can show a different aspect to the character we didn't see in the Third Age. Unfinished Tales describes her as proud, strong, and self-willed, which the rings of power Galadriel pretty accurately. And when Celebrimbor discovers what Sauron is up to later, he gives her one of the three elven rings, which sort of alters her personality, making her more wistful for the sea and diminishing finishing her love of Middle-earth. That, and being separated from her husband, who may have died when Sauron attacked Region later, she wouldn't be the calming presence she was when she met Frodo. Sauron choosing Mordor as his base of operations would make a great ending to the series, but we want to show his success at seducing some of the elves, and the splitting of the elders of Region. Unfinished Tales says Sauron convinced the elves at Region to rebel against Galadriel sometime between 1350 and 1400. This can be implied in between seasons, and Galadriel and Celeborn are just prepared preparing for something Sauron might do when he arrives at Region. Sauron's building of Baradur is where he stops acting magnanimously. No matter what he says, he's all about serving himself. He starts working in Mordor because of how powerful the Numenorians were getting. At this time, the Numenorians were pretty chill. If Sauron really was about peace in Middle-earth, he would have been psyched for help from Numenor, but he's not. Season 2. This one might be controversial, but our focus will be on the wizards. In Of the Rings of Power and the Third Age, found in the Cimmerillion, we're told there appeared in the West the Istari. But that doesn't mean this is the first time they showed up, and in fact, Sirdan knew who and what they were. In The Nature of Middle-Earth, we're told the Istari came to Middle-Earth back in the First Age. That book came out the year before Rings of Power, so it would be a stretch for the show to have been allowed to reference it. But Of the Rings of Power and the Third Age doesn't explicitly say they only showed up in the Third Age. If their mission was to fight Sauron, it'd be weird if Iluvatar didn't send them in the Second Age, when Sauron was at the height of his power. Of the Rings of Power and the Third Age tells us Saruman was the first to show up. Much like Sauron, I'd love to show Saruman before he turned evil. He might be brusque, but he still wants to defeat Sauron, at least at this point. If handled right, it would be heartbreaking to see him fall from his mission. The Cimmerillion tells us he went to Orthanc, built by the Numenorians when they started building stuff in Middle-earth. Maybe Saruman sought out the Numenorians because nobody else stands a chance against Sauron. And and maybe Saruman aiding the Numenorians is what convinces Sauron, I don't need to try brute force against them, I'll take them from within. If you got tired of the bad guy getting deliberately captured as part of his plan trope from about a decade ago, Sauron was doing it thousands of years ago. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We get to see how successful the wizards are or aren't at fulfilling their mission of stopping Sauron. The Cimmerillion tells us Gandalf was friendly with Elrond and the other elves. I would avoid having Elrond and Gandalf interact at least this early. I'd have Gandalf befriend Celebrimbor. We're told by 1600 of the Second Age, Celebrimbor perceived Sauron's true purpose. Maybe he had help with that. And not to take away Celebrimbor's agency, maybe because of Gandalf's guidance, he conceived the three elven rings without Sauron's assistance. Gandalf befriending Celebrimbor, friend to all, it makes sense Gandalf would absorb that friendliness in his travels. Interested in what the Blue Wizards were up to? So am I. Since there's almost nothing about them in Tolkien's works, the show can make up just about anything about them. Saruman journeyed east, and so did the Blue Wizards. Did they all travel together? Maybe. This bit about the wizards doesn't really get into date, so it'd be cool to see what made these guys split up if they did travel together. We'd spend a little time with the dwarves at Moria, who were friendly with the elves at Eregion. In the show, Durin III was okay with letting all the elves die, and I suspect that's because it's Lord of the Rings. Dwarves and elves don't like each other. But these dwarves and elves were on pretty good terms. The dwarves believe each Durin is a reincarnation of Durin the Deathless. I don't think each Durin is a direct son of the previous Durin, as they're not that long-lived. So two Durins wouldn't exist at the same time. But we would have flight clubby in conversations between Durin the Third and his predecessors, asking for advice. Maybe Durin the Second wasn't as friendly with elves as Durin the Third is, so that results in mixed emotions Durin might have in the lead up to the war. I'm a little fuzzy about what happens when, but Durin the Third got one of the seven dwarven rings, and Unfinished Tales said the dwarves did fight Sauron a little before the gates of Moria were closed in 1697. The appendices say the elves gave Durin the Third his ring rather than Sauron, and at first I thought that was just dwarf propaganda. Oh, we weren't seduced by Sauron, but if the dwarves fought Sauron right around when Celebrimbor told him where the rings were, it stands to reason they didn't start accepting gifts from him. While this isn't explicitly stated, maybe the doors of Moria are closed because the ring distracts Durin from the conflict. This season would end a few years after the war with Sauron begins. Celebrimbor dies, the dwarves go into hiding, Elrond founds Rivendell, our wizards can't work together, all seems hopeless. Season 3 spans from 1800 to 3255. That might sound like a 
lot to cover, but you can catch audiences up without feeling like you're covering an insane amount of time in eight episodes. Gandalf went east looking for the Blue Wizards, since Saruman and Radagast had their own ways of dealing with the Sauron problem. When he returns, Elrond catches him up on stuff we wouldn't have time to show. This would be where you would start hitting up Numenor politics. At first, everyone on Middle-earth is happy to see the Numenorians. They've been our friends forever, they brought us corn, and they're instrumental in driving back Sauron, even if he's not completely defeated. But around 1800, the Numenorians start to establish dominions in Middle-earth, and some will wonder if they've traded one enemy for another. While the Low Men are dealing with a harsher Numenor, Numenor gets into a civil war, while the Nazgul first appear. The Silmarillion makes it sound like the Nazgul only became kings, sorcerers, and warriors of old after they got the rings. When Gandalf comes back, whoa, there's a bunch of kingdoms of men that weren't here when I left. Maybe the Numenorians established their dominions because of the actions of the men who would later become the Nazgul. The Numenorians still see themselves as superior to the Low Men, but they might have had a good reason for laying down the law. That's consistent with our previous seasons, with Sauron and Saruman initially being somewhat sympathetic in their actions. The war's been going on for a while, and Galadriel has left Warrenan to take the fight to the enemy and reconnoiter with Elrond at Rivendell. This might explain how Elrond met Galadriel's daughter, who he eventually marries. When Galadriel first meets Gandalf, she probably doesn't like him. He's a representative of the Valar. She was involved in a rebellion against the Valar that resulted in her being banished to Middle-earth. And the ring changed her. Her husband might be dead. She feels like she has little left to live for. As far as participating in the war, I didn't have a problem with Galadriel being a warrior. Tolkien described her as of Amazon disposition, which probably refers to her stature and not any warring she might have done. But the people pitching a fit about this seem to forget Tolkien himself wasn't always locked into something he wrote. There are quite a few inconsistencies in his writing, which is understandable when you have a world of this size. Christopher Tolkien himself even comments on the many incongruities concerning Galadriel in Unfinished Tales. Just because The Lord of the Rings doesn't say she's a warrior doesn't mean she never was. Unfinished Tales says she and Celeborn weren't separated for that long, and while I'm okay with stretching their absence from each other a little, I don't know if I'd go for thousands of years. Elrond would be our focal character in this season, as his brother was the founder of Numenor. Elrond and Elros were half-elf, half-human, and were given the choice of which half they would live. Elros chose to be mortal and founded the kingdom of Numenor, while Elrond chose to be an elf and stayed in Middle-earth. This is briefly covered in Rings of Power, but we didn't get to see Elrond interact with the Numenorians or hear about how awful they had gotten. Elrond is torn between, do I join the men in resisting the Iron Fist of Numenor, who are like my distant nephews, or do I help Numenor and with our combined forces, we could find and defeat Sauron for good? Elrond might be instrumental in helping Tar Palantir see the error of Numenor's ways, helping Numenorians still in Middle-earth fight the Nazgul. The Silmarillion makes it clear Muriel didn't want to marry Farzan, but Muriel's complicated thoughts on her father's ideas and Numenor's relationship with the elves was some of my favorite stuff in the show. And the Silmarillion doesn't do a whole lot with her in the Akalabeth. She was supposed to be queen. Farazan takes the scepter, and when Numenor is destroyed, she dies. I would have her being overthrown by Farazan be more complicated than what the Silmarillion tells us. Like in the show, her family has the Palantir. That's a thing in the Silmarillion, though it mentions Elendil and his family having them, but they're related to Muriel, so that's okay. She sees the destruction of Numenor, maybe confides in Farazan, and he convinces her that Sauron is the enemy. If we can take him down, our problems will be over. Publicly, their air quotes marriage is a scandal because they're first cousins, so it appears to the public this was against her will. But privately, she's more okay with him taking the lead because of her misgivings with what she saw in the Palantir. This contradicts the Silmarillion, but the events in this time period are uncertain. We end our season with Farazan sailing to Middle-earth and defeating and capturing Sauron. Audiences would question this, this seems way too easy, and the Lord of the Rings movie showed his defeat in a different way, which should entice people to come back for season four. Muriel is a shell of who she once was, as she has brought Numenor to new lows. She sees her mistake in trusting Farazan, who, like many of our characters in this series, meant well in taking the fight to Sauron. But Sauron spent a few decades whispering in Farazan's ear, wouldn't it be neat if we did this, did that? Muriel is sure her actions will bring about the destruction of her home, which she tried to prevent. The Silmarillion gets into this whole thing about the White Tree. It's important to Numenor, and Sauron wants it destroyed. Azildur sneaks in and steals a fruit from the tree, getting wounded in the process. It's only when the fruit is planted and sprouts that Isildur wakes up from his coma. That's pretty explicitly a Cimmerillion thing, and if they couldn't use it, that's a shame, as that's my favorite Isildur stuff. I would elaborate on this. Elendil and his sons were basically exiled from the main part of Numenor, living on the outskirts because of their pro-elf beliefs. As Muriel knows there's no saving her home, she at least wants the tree to live on, and her family who aren't traitors. She sneaks to Elendil's camp to let them know Sauron is talking about destroying the tree. I can't do anything, but maybe I can alert the guard of a rumor I heard that 
someone is going to break into the other side of the castle and one of you can do something. She gives Elendil the Palantir their family guarded for centuries and she comes clean about her visions of the destruction of Numenor. Elendil says the only reason he stayed as long as he has is because they're waiting for his father to return from asking the Valar for help in setting things right on Numenor. But if things are as bad as Muriel says, they can all flee to Middle-earth. She declines his offer. She hopes she can persuade Farazhan to turn from the wicked path he's on. But she's unable to talk sense to her cousin, and not only does he listen to Sauron and cuts the tree down, but he leads an assault on Valinor, which leads to the destruction of Numenor. While Sauron survives the destruction, he loses his fair form and returns to Mordor looking like a shadow. Internet Movie Database Trivia says Amazon had to make this series distinct from the Peter Jackson films. But this looks an awful lot like how Sauron was depicted in Fellowship of the Ring, so I don't know if that's true. If not, this would be where Sauron would start looking like he did there. We'd spend half a season on the fall of Numenor, with the rest of the season showing the House of Elendil setting up their future kingdoms in Middle-earth. Eventually, Gil-galad becomes BFFs with Elendil, but with how hostile Numenor has been against Middle-earth, most of our principal characters in Middle-earth probably wouldn't be too happy to see these refugees coming to live on their home turf. And the Numenorians might not be too happy with the elves. Yeah, our ancestors were pretty brutal with you guys, but we could have used your help when the Apocalypse killed her friends and families. Where were the elves when Numenor fell? And Elendil isn't entirely wrong in his accusations. The Westlands, where Gil-galad lives, have had peace for a few thousand years by this point, and will only be seeing action again now that Sauron has returned from Numenor. This will be sort of a precursor to the last alliance of elves and men before they actually form a few decades later. We're going to do some more filling in the blanks here. In 3429, Sauron attacks Gondor and destroys the White Tree, the one from the seed Isildur rescued on Numenor. When Sauron was on Numenor, his advice was basically in service of seeing the Numenorians destroyed, and I've extrapolated he wanted that because they were the ones he thought stood the best chance of defeating him. So it makes sense why he wanted the White Tree and Numenor destroyed, but to then go out of his way to go to Gondor and destroy the newer White Tree, that just seems petty, unless he somehow has an intuition he needs to destroy the White Tree. And according to the Cimmerillion, the White Tree does have some special connection with Isildur, so perhaps something bad would happen to Isildur if it and all the other White Saplings were destroyed. Destroyed. How did Sauron get this intuition? Maybe from the Palantir when he was on Numenor, I don't know. Sauron's attack on Gondor will end this season, which will pretty much solidify the alliance between our main characters. Season 5 covers the formation of the last alliance of elves and men, more or less a precursor to the White Council we see in The Hobbit, all the way to the death of Sauron. This is where I assume the actual series will end, as there aren't any other good stopping spots after Forging of the Rings. It'd be super weird to end it with, and Sauron continued to be a threat to everyone on the planet. While the opinion Indices don't go very in-depth into Anarion, Isildur's younger brother, and neither does the Akalabeth. I'd say it was Anarion who brokered the peace between the different members of the Last Alliance. This gives him something to do, and when he's killed in 3440, just when it seems like this alliance might not hold together after all, his death kind of keeps everyone together. The Silmarillion is vague on where Isildur was when Anarion was killed. The last we heard of him, he was taking the seed that would become one of the White Trees of Gondor to safety, along with his wife and kids. We already know Isildur thinks the tree is very important, which explains why he went to great lengths to protect this one, and so was absent when his brother died. If we're allowed to reference Isildur's connection to the tree, then that would be a great way to explain where Isildur was when Anarion died. And while I added the wizards into the Second Age when we aren't sure they were present then, I didn't want Gandalf becoming a big mover and shaker of people and events like he was in the Third Age. But we aren't told he was there when Sauron was killed, so maybe Isildur convinces Gandalf to watch over his family wherever he takes them, explaining Gandalf's absence. Anyway, Gil-galad and Elendil kill Sauron while getting killed themselves, Isildur gets the ring, you know the rest. And <sighs> that's it. A little longer than what I intended when I decided to do a video on this series, and with how much I referred back to the text Amazon doesn't in theory have the rights to, I'm sure there are things I did in this video they wouldn't have been able to do. But, and of course I'm biased, I do think this would have made for a better story than the start of what we got from Rings of Power. If you guys agree, or if you don't, let me know. I do these kinds of videos often, so come back in the future to see what else I've got cooking. Until then, have a good one.